Welcome everyone. I'd like to welcome you to this month's webinar on landlord tenant issues during the COVID panic. And it's my privilege to be able to introduce our two panelists to you. Jeffrey Daybill from People's Legal Aid, a nonprofit, which he started to do tenant issues and debt collection issues. And Dave Todd from Colomore Law. Our speakers are going to present to you both sides of what has happened since the pandemic hit with landlord tenant. As you know, many of the, there was a moratorium on evictions for a period of time, and then that ceased and it caused a lot of backlog with cases. So our presenters will talk about that. They're going to speak for about 40 minutes after which we will have time for question and answer. Please use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Don't use the chat function, use the Q&A function and we will try to get all of your questions answered. Feel free to put questions in while the presentation is going on and then we will address as many questions as we can at the conclusion of the presentation. So with that introduction, I would like to turn it over to our presenters, Jeffrey and Dave, please take it away. Great. Thanks so much. I uh, am really excited to be here and presenting with Dave. Um, we usually are on opposite sides of the table, so it'll be fun to be uh, sort of presenting adversarially also. Um, but uh, we've got a, a couple of slides to just sort of guide our conversation. Um, and I'll just echo what Lori said. Uh, if you have questions, feel free to drop them in there and then we'll make sure to get after them at the end. Um, um, so uh, the landlord tenant sort of environment has changed pretty significantly over the past uh, eight or nine months with the COVID pandemic and um, specifically on the types of evictions that are still allowed, some of the restrictions on those. Um, so I think we have a pretty unique ability to be able to give both perspectives today. Um, so just as an outline of what we'll discuss, we're going to cover uh, the three uh, primary eviction moratoriums that impact uh, or impacted people in Utah. Um, some of the rental assistance options out there, uh, a consideration of the damages that have been sort of accruing, uh, some public policy issues, and then we'll have time for a question and answer. So the format of what we're going to do today is um, I'll sort of give you the tenant side first um, of how this uh, impacted tenants uh, generally, uh, at least here in Utah. And then uh, Dave will give uh, sort of the landlord's perspective on it and um, some considerations that way. So uh, the first moratorium that really hit uh, to prevent um, evictions was uh, under the CARES Act. And this federal moratorium was done um, as sort of an economic stimulus plan. So it was a little bit, uh, different um, in the sense that uh, it was really meant to help people stay in their homes so that they could uh, either continue to work or look for a different place to, um, to work and not have to necessarily worry about um, being removed from their homes. Uh, in order to qualify for that uh, moratorium, it, it was basically done uh, based on where you lived. So someone qualified for that moratorium based on the type of property that they lived in. Um, and so a landlord's property would qualify under a, a several different uh, ways. And I'll probably let Dave hit that because uh, we've, we've gone to bat a few times on what qualified and what didn't. Um, but uh, the impact of that really was that people were able to stay in their homes longer um, at least through from March to July, the end of July, without having to have any um, sort of movement towards an eviction. So all actions towards uh, removing someone from their home was uh, just um, stopped. There are some ongoing requirements that uh, our state has now um, added to the uh, unlawful detainer statutes. Um, and those are specifically uh, to uh, address the concerns of a 30 day notice that was provided um, after the moratorium. So that 30 day uh, notice has sort of been interpreted a couple of ways, but um, 
in the end, the way that our state interpreted it and added it into the law is that it um, only applies to uh, non-payment of rent cases. So basically if a tenant would have qualified under the CARES Act, it still uh, applies to them. And then the 30 day uh, notice period, um, at least as interpreted by uh, our legislature is um, given on the back end. So for the order of restitution, so people are given those 30 days to move out. Um, it's not clear how long that will um, end up being a requirement. Um, that's one of the only clauses in the CARES Act that didn't come with uh, some sort of termination clause. Um, and there are some interesting questions on to how long and what the impact of that is uh, when considering federal preemption over our state laws um, and specifically how that would preempt uh, a non-payment of rent case. Um, the governor's moratorium, so Governor Herbert issued a moratorium uh, that uh, essentially stopped any eviction moving forward if the tenant had uh, been um, current on their rent as of March 31st, um, and it went through uh, May 15th. Um, one of the issues with that moratorium specifically is some of the outlying uh, counties, so outside of Salt Lake County, uh, like Summit County, where um, the impact of the pandemic was felt a little bit earlier than other places just because of its reliance on uh, tourism uh, and the, you know, the ski industry. As those resorts started to shut down, a lot of people started to lose their employment. And then uh, some of them were not able to qualify for the governor's moratorium because they were hit a little bit earlier than the rest of the state. Um, and then the current moratorium that we have uh, is in, in contrast to the CARES Act is based on healthcare concerns. So the idea is to keep people in their homes so that if they're evicted, they're not um, either bunking up with friends or family members um, or going to a homeless shelter and therefore increasing the number of, uh, or increasing the possibility that they may contract or um, transmit COVID. Um, it came out September 4th and uh, is currently set to expire on December 31st. Um, although there are, is language in there that would allow it to be continued uh, longer than that, but it hasn't it hasn't been um, continued longer than that. So um, also in contrast to the CARES Act or the federal moratorium, an, an individual qualifies now based on the tenant status. So they have to provide a declaration that uh, requires that they meet certain criteria. Um, for example, they have to be uh, using all available resources to try to find rental assistance. Um, they have to, um, make best efforts to make partial payments in rent uh, during the, uh, the temporary halt. Um, they're limited to $99,000 um, income or 198,000 if they're a married couple. So there are, there are certain things that are required by the tenant to be able to qualify. Um, and this interestingly enough does not stop um, a lawsuit from moving forward. Um, it just stops someone from actually being evicted from the property, which, um, as I'm sure Dave could attest, uh, before we had clearer guidance on this from the CDC, uh, the tenant's position was as soon as they gave a CDC declaration that had to stop all litigation, um, that's sort of been changed now, so the litigation can actually move forward. Uh, it just can't actually remove someone um, and the impact of this, uh, we'll talk about more when we discuss some of the considerations in, in damages and how that's been accruing. Um, but it's not overly clear that some of the unlawful detainer or the eviction damages that would normally accrue in an eviction case um, are not also going to continue to accrue now. For example, uh, the treble damages. Um, so essentially when someone overstays their three day notice um, on the following day, they can begin accruing treble damages. And it's, it's unclear whether or not we'll, um, well, one, that if landlords will be able to collect on it, but also if they're uh, going to be eligible to seek after it anyway. 
Um, and so with that, I'll let Dave give us the landlord's perspective on that. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, yeah, so I, I, uh, I'm a landlord attorney, work for uh, Law Office of Kirk Colomore. Uh, me and Jeff uh, work often together, uh, usually against each other, but, uh, but it's, it's good to be here with him and to talk about these issues uh, that we deal with every day. And uh, for the last, uh, I don't know, seven, eight months or so, uh, it's, it's been kind of a wild ride uh, for everybody and, and particularly with landlord tenant law, um, you know, changes that are happening all the time, uh, federal laws, state laws, um, uh, president's orders, governor's orders, all that stuff. So it, it definitely is, uh, I don't want to say exciting time because it's not real ex exciting. Uh, <laughs> it's a changing time, but uh, just to, to give a little idea on the landlord's perspective with some of these things, and we'll get it in, into more of it, like Jeff said, as, as we go along. Um, first, with the CARES Act, as, as Jeff mentioned, the CARES Act really is um, putting, uh, essentially telling properties, hey, if you are getting federal assistance, um, your mortgage is backed with a federal loan, something like that. As the federal government, what we are doing is we're telling you that you can't um, move forward with an eviction. And, and that was uh, from the Mar March timeframe through through July. And and the reason, and, and that's really the reason why it was with those properties is because essentially those properties, what the federal government is saying is, hey, you're getting help from us. Well, we're, we're entitled to uh, uh, prevent you from doing some things then. And, um, and, and there were some, uh, provisions in place for landlords and different properties to get some help, some uh, um, forbearance help where they don't need to pay their rent as well or their mortgage payment um, and that kind of thing. So um, the 30-day uh, the, uh, notice issue. So the, the CARES Act did expire. However, there is still this ongoing issue of uh, whether or not a landlord is still required to provide a resident with a 30 day notice to vacate the property. Um, and, and when would that 30 day notice requirement expire? As Jeff pointed out, the, the statute, uh, um, well, both, both of our sides would probably argue that it, it clearly um, either applies still or it doesn't, but, uh, but Jeff is right in that there, it doesn't specifically stay in the say in the statute that the 30-day requirement does not apply uh, once the CARES Act expires. So um, the judges, it, it's been really interesting uh, all over the state. They've been all over the board on interpretation of, of this federal law, how it's been applied. It seems to be that there is a little more consistency now uh, as, as judges get uh, familiar with it. But it is kind of an ongoing issue that uh, is not just an issue with Utah, but nationally and landlords trying to navigate whether or not they still need to give this 30 day notice. Um, as Jeff mentioned, the governor's moratorium, uh, really what that did is uh, the governor's moratorium essentially said, well, even if you're not covered by the CARES Act landlord, uh, we, we've got this other moratorium as well. So, so that had an impact, um, obviously not as long. Uh, at the time, it seemed like it was, it was long. And I know a lot of landlords would uh, tell me that it, it was way too long. But uh, looking back now, it, it seems as though it was uh, just a, a little blip in the whole time frame with all of this. Um, and then currently, uh, the CDC moratorium is, is really kind of the big thing that's, that's being dealt with right now. Um, as Jeff mentioned, that ends in December, December 31st. Um, what, what that does, and um, Jeff already mentioned it, but essentially any issue for non-payment, if it's a non-payment of rent issue and a resident uh, qualifies by providing this declaration, um, then the landlord cannot 
evict them for non-payment of rent until the beginning of the year. So there are issues with the with different cases as far as whether or not an affidavit provided by a tenant is sufficient, uh, whether or not uh, a landlord has the right to challenge that affidavit in court and require that the, the resident provide evidence that they actually have sought out rental assistance, um, made best efforts to make partial payments, those kind of things. Those are still some of the big issues that are still being uh, litigated in court, uh, being brought up in court. And uh, so it, it, it's challenging kind of working through these things just to give uh, you a little idea. And I apologize for not having the numbers up on the screen, but uh, just an idea on some numbers in Utah as far as evictions go. And just to give you an idea on what some of these moratoriums the effect that they've had just on, on straight up numbers with evictions. Um, there's, I mean, you've got a, a three year average of, you're around 500 to 600 evictions per month, um, typically. And, and that's pretty, that's pretty uh, consistent per each month. And that's actually how the year started. That's about where it was in January, February, and then March, you can see a big dip. Um, all of a sudden, uh, it drops by about 14%. And then in April, it drops by uh, over 60%. Um, and then in May, June, July, drops by about 50%. So basically, the amount of evictions that are being filed um, are, are essentially at about half of what they normally would be um, as indicated by the last three years. So that just gives you a little bit of an idea on um, just from a number standpoint, what, what's happened with the eviction landscape, uh, the legal landscape on that and, uh, and how that might affect both tenants and landlords. Uh, as, as Jeff mentioned, you know, there's an impact on, on residents because a lot of this stuff is not rent forgiveness. Um, and so they, they may have some relief as far as time goes, but as uh, financial relief, that's a little more of a difficult issue. So uh, lastly, with the preemption issue, again, me and Jeff have uh, gone to bat with, with judges on this issue before. The Utah State Legislature uh, attempted to uh, clarify what, what their interpretation was of the CARES Act. And that was implemented with changes to state law in the unlawful detainer statutes. Uh, some judges have said, uh, yes, that state law applies and I'm gonna follow that. Some judges have said, no, federal law preempts all of that. Some judges have said federal law preempts some of that, but not all of it. So it's, it's, a, it's an interesting area of law right now uh, dealing with federal preemption, uh, dealing with uh, different judges' interpretations of, of federal law and state law and the interaction with that. So um, that's what I've got for this slide, Jeff, if, if we want to move on or. Perfect. Thanks, Dave. Um, it, it has been fun to see the differences in how the judges will rule. And uh, I like that Dave put it in those three categories. I probably would have put them in like, we won... Dave won, or we tied somewhere in the middle. So it's it's been interesting to watch how the different courts have interpreted that for sure. Um, there are uh, some programs available for tenants and for landlords. Um, a part of the CARES Act provided um, quite a few dollars uh, up, that made it available for um, the state to decide how they were going to distribute those funds. So anywhere in Utah, a tenant can call 211 and they will get them in contact with the agency that's been designated for that county or for their area. Um, Salt Lake County by far received the most uh, funds um, and that's being distributed through Utah Community Action. So um, one of the things that we've seen uh, from the tenant side is um, as the process for eviction moves forward, 
Um, we've been using uh, some of the clauses in the unlawful detainer statute to extend the period required for an answer or for an occupancy hearing uh, so that we can help these folks get into some sort of rental relief program. Um, and I think rightly so, the, the landlords are also interested in getting paid. Uh, so most often they're willing to work with us and sort of delay that process so that we can uh, work out a, something that's mutually agreeable for everyone. Um, there are also a handful of uh, private uh, organizations that have been providing rental relief. Um, so like Jewish Family Services has done a lot. Um, Park City Community Foundation has done a lot. Um, Catholic Communities. All of these people have provided uh, some sort of uh, incremental rental relief as it's gone on, um, which has been great because it, uh, it has sort of brought into view um, some of the gaps uh, that some of the federal programs can't provide support for. Um, specifically like mixed documented families um, or undocumented families. Uh, a lot of these private uh, foundations or community programs have really stepped in to um, try to keep people housed, um, especially as we wait for, um, I'm, I live in Wasatch County. Um, so as, as some of these rural counties that rely heavily on tourism uh, are starting to get ramped back up, um, it's been helpful to have these private uh, entities provide some rental relief. Um, and I'll let Dave talk about the landlord assistance stuff. Yeah, so uh, th there is a lot of assistance out there right now. And as, as we talked about earlier, one of the requirements for a resident to uh, halt an eviction for non-payment of rent under the CDC order. And by the way, the CDC order, there are some challenges to that right now from a, a legal standpoint. If anyone's interested in kind of the um, more legal nerd stuff with, with that, uh, there's, there's some challenges as to whether or not uh, President Trump could do what he did. Um, but we won't get into, into too much of that. But what, one of the requirements under the CDC uh, moratorium on evictions, a resident is required to include in their affidavit that they have, they've used their best efforts to obtain rental assistance, uh, whether that's through government, church, something like that. Um, as Jeff mentioned, there's, there's help out there, are a lot of different organizations. A lot of what we work with is community action. Uh, when we're uh, working with uh, with tenants and landlords trying to get these issues resolved. Uh, I do agree with Jeff, you know, uh, landlords do want to get paid, you know, ultimately for, for the majority of, of these uh, individuals or businesses, it, it, it is part of their livelihood. And so money talks, uh, that's, just, that's just the way it is. Uh, just a little bit about the LHAP program. Um, that's something that was really implemented, I believe, uh, beginning of September. Um, there was uh, several millions of dollars um, uh, set aside in the state of Utah. And basically what, what that is doing is that's allowing landlords to apply for these funds essentially on behalf of their resident. So what they do is, is they go to the resident and they say, hey, if you're having problems uh, with paying rent because of, you know, loss of income, whatever it is, you've been negatively affected by COVID, and uh, you you can you can apply for these funds, and we can help you do that. And and they have the they have the tenant fill out a um, a little bit of information, and then the landlord is the one that actually submits that to the state, and the state then will send. Um, funds to the landlord. And those funds, the, the nice thing about that is that those funds, they, they go directly to paying off whatever that debt is of the tenant. So it's kind of a win-win for everybody. It, it has been a little um, fun on our end here at our office, uh, switching gears a little bit in that we are helping our landlords help the, the tenants 
um, utilize these funds. And so instead of where normally we're the bad guy calling saying, hey, you know, you need to pay something or you need to leave. It's basically, you know, letting them know that there's there's some free money out there, some free assistance, and we, we want to help you get that because ultimately that helps the landlord. So yeah, there are a lot of options out there. I think Jeff would probably concur that one of the biggest hurdles is just getting that information out to uh, residents so that they know how to effectively use that. Uh, I think there's um, a question on the uh, Q&A we'll get to later that will kind of address some of that in more detail, but that's all I've got with rental assistance. <laughs> Great, thanks Dave. Um, so uh, just to talk about the damages, um, there's some interesting arguments right now and I, I think I saw in the in one of the questions that was proposed um, that, you know, ideally we can answer in this and if not, we can address specifically later. But um, whether a tenant is eligible uh, to have these damages sought after, I think is um, going to be an interesting question that will arise once the amounts are settled upon. Um, but uh, the idea of them actually being recoverable um, at least in our experience representing tenants, um, uh, the courts put out uh, this year that the average um, amount sought in an eviction case was around $400. And the final judgment ended up being uh, somewhere between the three and $7,000 range. Um, I think that average is likely to change just with so much um, accrual of rent. And I've, I've put a word problem in here that uh, you can read and we can kind of go over, but uh, to talk about the types of damages that were eligible um, under the different moratoriums, um, I think the government has been really careful to not uh, include any type of rent forgiveness um, so that there is uh, a little bit more buy-in from the landlord's perspective. Um, but during the, the period of the CARES Act, the federal moratorium, um, they couldn't accrue uh, late fees. Um, and basically the only uh, amounts that were able to be um, accrued were the non-payment of rent. So just your rent amounts would um, continue to accrue. The governor's moratorium, I think was short enough that it wasn't uh, as impactful at um, stating what types of fees uh, were eligible. Um, but the the moratorium did state that they were suspending um, the whole of the um, Unlawful Detainer Act uh, as it pertained to non-payment of rent cases. So um, those also provided us with some interesting opportunities for litigation on what that meant um, and what, uh, what fees were eligible during that period. And the CDC temporary halt, um, actually our firm is currently in litigation about whether treble damages are eligible to continue to accrue. Um, in the moratorium, it does state that um, fees, rent, and penalties may continue to accrue during the period um, of the moratorium. So um, the issue that we're litigating right now is whether or not uh, the term penalties would include the statutory penalties of treble damages or not. Um, I think it's likely that our arguments um, will have some public policy on their side just because if, for example, if someone uh, was eligible for the CDC temporary halt the beginning of September um, and provided that declaration um, and were um, at that time already unlawfully detaining the premises. So they'd already overstayed a notice. Um, you know, if treble damages were allowed to continue to accrue through the end of the year, um, over those four months, um, a tenant would be uh, eligible for an entire year's worth of rent at the termination of that moratorium. And I don't, our arguments are, uh, 
pretty different on on both sides just because of how vague the the statute or the rule was written by the CDC. Um, that being said, there's uh, just to give a little like insight into how we feel how we think about it. Um, there's really only three states in the entire country that allow for traveling of damages um, in an eviction action. Um, and one of the states, it's um, you either get treble damages or you get attorney's fees. Um, so there, there are differing uh, sides of how that those damages can be accrued throughout the country. Um, so our position is basically that um, this was an emergency order. It's likely they didn't do a 50 state survey on how uh, the different damages are calculated in each state. Um, so uh, our position is that the folks uh, that are in these situations would not technically be unlawfully detaining uh, their property because they have the ability to continue there um, based on a law. So um, you're only eligible for treble damages if you're found to be unlawfully detaining the property. Um, that same argument doesn't swing uh, the other way in to be able to uh, dismiss the lawsuit. So um, it'll be interesting to see how uh, the courts will rule with us on the treble damages, uh, because if we're able to show that the tenant is not in uh, or unlawfully detaining their property, um, and if they hold with us on that, then uh, the logical conclusion is that they shouldn't also be in the litigation because in order to have a lawsuit for eviction, um, a tenant has to be an unlawful detainer. So there, there are definitely two sides of that coin. Um, and uh, we've tried arguing the, uh, to dismiss cases based on this, um, but the guidance from the CDC that came out uh, the first week or two of October made it clear that a lawsuit could still be initiated um, and taken through to its logical conclusion with the exception of actually removing someone from the property. So um, I threw up this uh, word problem uh, and it's, um, it's all just for simple math. Um, but if someone was eligible for the CARES Act, uh, and didn't have to pay rent. And then uh, if it was one of those clients that Dave and I litigated over whether or not the 30 day notice uh, requirement uh, was required or not before that uh, Utah state law came into play, um, they weren't removed from their property in August. And uh, then they would be eligible for the CDC declaration uh, assuming that they met the requirements for that. So um, it's interesting to see how, uh, if they were able to pay their monthly rent of a thousand dollars over the course of the 10 months or the year, they'd only have paid $12,000 total. Um, but based on uh, the worst case scenario, at least from our position for the tenants, um, it's possible that they could be looking at upwards of $20,000 uh, as part of a judgment. And just from our perspective, um, a lot of our uh, clients end up going through the garnishment stages because they uh, are evicted because of some uh, catastrophic event in their life, whether it be the loss of a, uh, employment or a health issue. Um, and for whatever reason, they're not able to make their rent. Um, but being able to come up with the additional damages to be able to stay in their properties or in their contract uh, at the end of uh, at the end of this moratorium come January first is also going to be um, somewhat of a concern for them. Um, and uh, I know there's concerns on the landlord side also with being able to meet their requirements, and I'll let Dave talk to that. There's huge concerns, Jeff. Um, no, they're huge. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, that it, it, it is a, an issue. And that's, I, I saw that's one of the questions in the, the Q and A. It's a great question on the issue of unlawful detainer, how, how all of this affects an ultimate judgment, judgment down the road. Um, 
I, I think the CARES Act is pretty clear uh, on, on how to deal with that. And I agree with Jeff that really, the, I, I think the bigger issue is with this CDC moratorium and what the effects are uh, when it states that rent and fees and, and, and those other things will continue. Um, really on the issue of treble damages, and uh, I, I like how the, the question that was put in the Q&A was, how can you be um, unlawfully detaining property if, if there's actually a law that says that you can stay in the, in the property? And, and so I think that's a good, uh, good question. Just for, for those of you that don't uh, do this stuff all the time, you, as Jeff said, Utah's uh, unlawful detainer, detainer statute provides for a lot of these things. And so that's where they get this, um, this treble damage uh, situation from. Under the Utah law, and it's 78B6802C, if you want to look that up, uh, it, it basically says that a tenant is unlawfully detaining property if they continue in possession after default in the payment of rent or other amounts due and after a notice in writing requiring in the alternative payment of rent or the surrender of the detained premises, if that's remained uncomplied with for a period of three days after service. So under Utah law, it, it, it really gives the definition of what unlawful detainer is. And it doesn't have to do with um, whether or not a judge says, hey, I'm gonna give you more time in the property. What it has to do with is whether or not you complied with this notice and so there, and, and obviously that's the landlord's uh, point of view on that, but um, sometimes this issue comes up not related to a moratorium, um, but I think they're related in that if you, if, um, if a resident is disputing an eviction and goes to um, an eviction hearing in front of a judge to argue this, uh, bef before all of the, the COVID pandemic uh, issues, the standard was, because that's what's stated in Utah law, is that if a defendant is found to have failed to comply with the notice, uh, they need to vacate the property within three days. Sometimes due to uh, um, extenuating circumstances, the judge will say, okay, I'm gonna give you seven days. And what happens is, is even though the judge has said, I'm going to allow you seven days to vacate the property, it doesn't now say that they are lawfully detaining the property. It just says that you cannot have a constable or a sheriff go remove them. So, you know, and, and, and that's an issue that's just going to have to have to be litigated. I, I will say from a landlord standpoint and this uh, word problem that Jeff put together first, that made me nervous just reading through it. Um, I, felt like it was, I was on an exam and I was missing stuff and I was getting the wrong answer. And, um, but it, it, it does bring up a big issue because if, if a resident is, and to the resident's credit, they're not um, necessarily aware of all of these issues with treble damages and, and how ultimately this will affect them. When they see a CDC halt on evictions, um, they they don't they don't really know the consequences of okay i'm going to i'm going to take advantage of that and so it, again it's a it's an information issue that that is uh difficult to get that information to a resident but i can tell you right now that most landlords do not want a judgment against someone for $27,000 uh knowing that that person was struggling to pay their $1000 rent um, and that gets into issues of whether or not uh, you can collect and uh, bankruptcy, all that stuff. So, um, Jeff, do you want, I, I, I don't know if you saw that from Lori, but um, we, we do have a lot of questions and maybe with the time we've got, we can jump to those and, and start answering some of those. But let's just start with the questions and get those answered. Do landlord lawyers have an obligation to advise tenants about the ways they can delay evictions? Jeff, do you, I, um, I'll, I'll jump in. I, uh, 
it says do landlord lawyers and I'll call myself a landlord lawyer. So um, no, there's, there's no real um, set in stone obligation for a landlord uh, to let a resident know. That being said, a lot of the courts, when they have different orders, things like that, uh, they'll put something in an order uh, letting them know about a lot of these different things. So unless Jeff has a different uh, take on that, I, 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 I'm not aware of anything that requires that. No, and I agree with that. Although we have uh, sort of petitioned some local governments to see if they would make that a requirement or to make it a requirement that um, the CDC declaration form also be filed uh, or given to a tenant when they um, are going through an eviction process. But I think at least based on what we've seen with a lot of our clients is that um, a lot of landlords are doing that. And I think it's probably out of the advice from uh, attorneys like Dave and the Utah Apartment Association, just giving them access to it is, is really the biggest thing that we've seen. And, and sorry, just one more thing on that, Lori. The, um, the, the courts are requiring a landlord to provide an affidavit before they can get an eviction order. That affidavit uh, does require the landlord to say that they, um, they are or they are not covered by CARES and that they have or have not received a CDC declaration. So, and those are things that need to be filed with the court that ultimately then would be provided to the resident. Okay, I think you answered the unlawful detainer question, but let's jump down to this one. What efforts have courts determined are sufficient to qualify as best efforts? That's um, also an interesting question. Um, it depends on the judge. Uh, at least in our experience. Um, usually what we try to argue is that the CDC declaration is an ongoing affidavit. So uh, if they provide it now, um, it doesn't necessarily mean that in the past, if they haven't done best efforts, that they wouldn't do best efforts starting now. Like maybe they weren't aware of the declaration and so now they've started to do best efforts. Um, but it, it really does depend on on the judge, at least in our experience. Yeah, and, and I agree with that. I, I think it does depend on the judge. Um, just from a landlord's point of view and a landlord attorney's point of view, if, if a CDC declaration has been provided, essentially how that's kind of first seen in our office and, and talked to with our clients is it's almost like a bankruptcy notice. Put everything on hold. Um, and, and let's see what's going on. Uh, the only time that I've seen that landlords really get into challenging a CDC declaration from a resident is when the landlord claims to have tried to get a hold of the resident to get them involved with one of these organizations like Community Action, something like that. Um, or if our office has tried to um, contact the resident to get some help through this LHAP program. Um, and we're just not getting anywhere with that. There's no communication, anything like that. Even then, typically what happens is a hearing is requested in front of the judge. The concerns are brought up. The resident usually will um, appear and understand that they need to cooperate. And, and usually you can move forward with, with that that way. Is mediation used often in these cases? Um, mediation, so most of the cases that we handle are, are Salt Lake County, as you can imagine. Um, usually mediation doesn't happen until the parties are in court. Um, okay. Sometimes it happens before then because there are some connections between um, individuals with community action or for example, I, I know that Jeff represents a lot of individuals. And so we reach out to each other and try to get things resolved beforehand that way. Uh, so, but as far as uh, required mediation, formal mediation, that, that, that doesn't really happen. Okay. 
Do the principles you are discussing apply in commercial landlord tenant situations or just residential? So the moratoriums have been specifically geared towards residential evictions. Um, and that's as much as I know about the commercial side. We don't represent any commercial uh, tenants. And, and just on the commercial side, I, I agree. It, do, it doesn't apply. Uh, we're, we're actually, you know, we were in court yesterday on that very issue uh, with a, a commercial tenant arguing that some of these things applied to them. And at least the court in that instance said that, um, that none of that did apply to a commercial tenant. They are supposed to have some other options with um, different government programs to help them get some funds to pay their rent, so. Okay, so there's a comment here that the CARES Act funds, both HAP and LHAP will be exhausted by December 1. Utah Community Action, the largest agency, is no longer taking new applications and LHAP was 8 million in the past few weeks, corporate landlords have drawn a million per week. What happens when the money runs out? Jeff, do you want yeah, me to comment on that? I, <laughs> <laughs> the, there uh, are no answers, right? Well, that, um, the, so the at least from our perspective, oh, go ahead. Go oh, ahead, no, Jeff. go ahead, Jeff. So from our Jeff. perspective, we, we try to tap into all sorts of resources that, um, that our, the CARES Act is a part of. So um, if we can get funding through Jewish Family Services, um, some of the community foundations, uh, actually almost all of them are offering some sort of rental relief at this point. Um, I know Catholic Communities is doing a lot. So um, if the CARES Act money does dry up, and I'm surprised to hear that they're not taking new applications. Uh, we have clients still uh, in the process for that, but um, I guess it wouldn't surprise me based on how many people are still needing it. Uh, but if it dries up, um, hopefully a new program comes up. Okay. If a landlord gets rent money from the Utah Landlord Slush Fund, can they still evict tenants for non-payment of trouble damages, attorney's fees, or other charges? I, th I'm, I think I'm gonna that's jump a in question for you, Dave. <laughs> so um, the, the landlord slush fund, um, I, I'm not sure exactly what fund that's talking about. If it's the landlord housing assistance program, um, there are some restrictions on um, how much you can still charge a resident. I'll tell you right now that almost all of the, all of those, if they're getting funds from what we call the LHAP program, uh, they're, they're not able to pursue uh, travel damages, things like that. Essentially it's um, trying to get them back on track. Um, Something that's been called a slush fund before is it, it, there's a separate fund for uh, landlords to access once a resident has vacated the property and obtained a judgment against a resident, they can pursue some funds there. That's a separate fund, but um, <clears throat> there's the, I'll tell you right now, this landlord housing assistance program, it was put in place really quickly, uh, trying to get funds out as quick as possible. And I'm sure there's going to be a lot of uh, discussion to be had about what happens with some of these after everything expires. So, Okay. Do you have any estimates on the number of tenants who are not current on rent in the property due to the moratorium? So uh, one indicator that we have, uh, we created a, a website for people to fill out the CDC declaration form and have it emailed to their uh, landlord or their landlord's attorney. Um, since we created that at uh, the beginning of September, it's been, and I just pulled up the numbers, it's been viewed 5,000 times um, and just under 600 people have submitted one. So uh, that doesn't mean that we're the only place that has those. Um, so I, you know, it's just one, um, one indicator of at least that many people who uh, 
are not able to pay their rent and have submitted uh, at least a request to be considered eligible for that program. Um, I think the, the other indicators from, uh, like for example, I was on a meeting yesterday with the Park City uh, School District and they have uh, some serious concerns about um, eviction notices, but they, um, it's hard to tell how many people are actually struggling with rent um, because we don't generally see them until it's at litigation. So whether an, a landlord has provided a notice or not, um, I think we probably see a, a, a much smaller number than the actual people that get evicted. But there are still people remaining in their housing without paying rent because of the moratorium. Right. Absolutely. Okay. And, and the numbers that we saw a couple of months back, um, especially during the CARES Act uh, moratorium, it was actually quite surprising uh, how many residents were still showing to be current on their rent and still uh, moving forward with, with, uh, with their lease agreements. There was a little bit of a drop as far as rent received, but it was surprisingly not a, a huge drop. And, uh, and maybe this goes to the next question. I'll wait for that, but. Okay. So you mentioned that evictions were down by 50% now, and doesn't that mean there will be a flood of evictions in January when there are no more special rules or funds to help? I mean, what happens then? We were expecting a huge flood of litigation when it ended in, ju in July. And did that happen? And will it happen in January? So, no, and, that, and that's a great question and a great concern that's out there. I, I know that's a, a concern out there. Just to give you the numbers for Utah on evictions. So um, evictions in August of this year, um, there were 671 evictions. And the three-year average prior to that was 638.3. So um, that, that gives you a little idea. I think it, there was some increase, but it wasn't the flood that was expected by some people in the state and in the, and in the country. And we, from our end, we anticipate that something similar, if there's no additional moratoriums, um, it may look somewhat similar. These are things that are not just um, going to all of a sudden uh, 2000 evictions in January, uh, it, it'll be something that's drawn out because a lot of these issues get worked out through, through the months, but, um, that, that's what we've seen with the numbers. Okay. Are landlords taking the legal position that tenants are liable for attorney's fees that the landlords incur in litigating the effect of the moratoria executive orders and statutes? Is that, that's probably a question for me. Yes, um, yeah. I mean, I would love to bill your clients for litigating <laughs> over that. <laughs> yeah. Are the um, tenants liable for the landlord's attorney's fees, do you think? Well, I'm gonna say that's a little bit of a loaded question, but um, yes, if ultimately, if a resident is deemed to be considered to be an unlawful detainer of the property, uh, even if, they are allowed to stay until the end of the year. Uh, Utah law requires uh, that a judgment be entered with attorney fees for the landlord, that the resident has to pay those. Okay. Um, yeah. But those that are there due to the effects of the moratoria or the executive orders, is it the same? Or do, do they it really is. have it, to be found to be unlawfully heavy? having unlawfully detained. They, they, they would need to have been found as unlawfully detaining the property. And I think that goes back to that earlier question of, are they considered to be unlawfully detaining the property during the moratorium? And if a judge says yes, then the attorney fees would apply. If a judge says no, there's probably still going to be some attorney fees, but um, maybe not as much if, if it was the other way around. Okay. How are suits for issues other than non-payment succeeding when a tenant is also behind on rent? 
So we've seen an, an increase in other types of cases, um, but I think that is probably uh, due to the fact that a lot of cases can't be brought for non-payment of rent. Um, so there are just a, a plethora of other ways to evict someone um, if they're struggling with uh, the tenant. Um, we see a lot of lease terminations or month to month terminations uh, where the landlord just has a statutory right to terminate that agreement. Um, but to sort of piggyback off of what Dave just said a minute ago about the attorney's fees, um, at least in our experience, we um, seem to be able to work out similar agreements uh, to what we would have gotten prior to COVID, even if there was some extended uh, litigation. And I think that's mostly the landlord and you know attorneys like Dave just realizing that if they're going to get anything from our clients, it's probably not going to be an increase in what they would have normally gotten anyway. Um, so uh, at least that's been our experience with the Colomores law firm that they uh, are generally uh, willing to stay within the like the reasonable range of attorney's fees that we would have normally sought outside of uh, some sort of moratorium. Okay. So based upon the numbers, the August eviction filings in 2020 were higher than 2019. Does that sound right to you guys? Yes, and that's accurate. And that's why I say the 2020 August evictions were at 671. The prior three-year average was 638.30. So okay. it, 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 it was up by 5%, which is definitely an increase, but... Um, but not the flood of evictions that was uh, kind of the fear that might happen in August. Sure. And I think a so, lot of that was, oh, sorry. No, go ahead. I was just going to say, I think a lot of that was due to the um, ambiguity around the 30 day notice requirement at the end of the CARES Act. Um, so a lot of those evictions were given. Um, and I think a lot of people, I think the number would have been higher had there not been that additional clause of the 30 day eviction notice requirement. Um, so I think January, if the extensions or if the moratoriums aren't extended will be a true tell of uh, the actual number of evictions that are gonna either start a trend um, or just be the trend. Okay, do you think this has fundamentally changed landlord tenant law and if any of these changes will be permanent or will it go back when things ever allegedly normalize? So uh, from our point of view, it's been really helpful to bring uh, the impact of the landlord tenant law uh, into more of a public view. Um, and that's mostly because now there's people being evicted that in the past would never have even come close. Um, I know in the, the Salt Lake Trib today, there was an article about a previous University of Utah basketball player, but um, our firm is represented uh, like professors at the U that all of a sudden have had to uh, either leave or um, their courses have been cut. Uh, I mean, people that have traditionally uh, been safer from the threat of eviction uh, are now facing that option. So um, it seems like it's been at least beneficial to the tenant side to be able to bring some of those um, issues to the forefront of a public policy debate. So we're hoping that it does, does lead to better change. Um, one thing that we'd like to see is some more mediation um, that a lot of these things have forced us to do. So um, I know a, a couple of weeks ago, Dave sent me an email and was like, hey, is this guy submitted a CDC declaration? And that was before the, the case had even been filed. So, I mean, it, the moratoriums have, uh, I would say increased our ability to negotiate before it gets into a lawsuit and you know extra fees are tacked on. Um, so I think that part of it uh, has been a good change and I hope that that continues into the future. Okay, Dave, do landlords support another CARES Act type bill that gets more money to people? Wouldn't this prevent or reduce evictions? Great question. Uh, yes and no. So uh, my understanding and, and being involved with the Utah Apartment Association as well, uh, 
landlords definitely do want assistance. Um, they do they do want help. Uh, what they don't want is uh, more moratoriums. The the reason and one of the reasons with the issue with the moratoriums is that it it really ultimately, if you keep playing this out, puts a huge strain on the already strained housing market, where you have people that are already having a difficult time trying to find places to live. And when you bottle this up, where you're not allowing um, landlords to, to get people out and transition other people in um, and, and putting more restriction on that end of it, it creates, a, it creates a big problem. And I don't think it's a problem that is just for um, landlords, I think it's a problem for renters as well. And, it, and, and so they do want some help for sure. And, and they do want that. It's just a question of how that, what, what that looks like and whether or not that is continuing to prevent them from letting people know they've got to vacate if they don't pay. Okay. Well, you guys, thank you so much. This is a packed topic, and I really appreciate you coming and participating today and getting this information out. For those of you that were here to listen, we will be sending out the slide deck as well as the um, CLE certificate. And eventually this will show up on the U's, the law school's YouTube page so that you can watch it and review it with the slides that were prepared. So. Thank you very much to everyone and thank you to our speakers. Have a good day and a good thank weekend. Thank you.